everybody to this very important meeting of the PDC as we hopefully do the people's work. Um, at this time, um, first item on the agenda is the approval of the agenda. And we have one item that we want to add on the new business on uh, advanced manufacturing. And uh, Dwight's going to cover that. Uh, is there anything else or any other items that we want to add for you? Move for approval. Okay. Item three, the workshop agenda. Yeah, oh, I'm sorry, we need to move on that. I move to approve the uh, agenda. All right, second, second Dr. Ward. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. So all of the localities that were involved in the special order by consent needed to vote on whether or not to sign the MOA for the hybrid sewer plan by February 28th. And the good news is everyone voted and everyone voted yes. So that's where we're moving forward. The key component of the hybrid plan is that HRSD is going to fund and implement, implement all the projects that are required to prevent overflows um, during wet weather events, so when it rains. That means localities still have to maintain their sewer system so there aren't overflows in dry weather. So that's typically caused by um, tree roots, um, when fog and oil, or so fats, oils, and grease clog systems and sort of design flaws. But it's a big step forward. Here are the votes by locality. Um, there, were, there was a lot of debate, some delays, but at the end of the day, uh, there were a lot of unanimous votes. Here's the summary of the regulatory process moving forward. In your packet is the letter that HRSD sent to the EPA and DEQ telling them that we wanted to move forward with a hybrid plan. Now HRSD has until the end of August to negotiate with EPA to modify the federal consent decree to include the hybrid plan. Then as that wraps up, the localities will negotiate with DEQ to modify the state special order by consent. And that's going to be a lot more straightforward and simple because a lot of the liability now has shifted from localities to HRSD. And here are the remaining steps. Um, HRSD will be working on the wet weather plan. That's a list of projects, basically two types of projects. Projects that fix existing pipes and pumps that are leaking and letting rainwater get into the system and causing overflows. And then if that doesn't sort of fix the problem, then they'll replace some of the pipes and pump stations and such to be bigger, to have extra capacity. In the meantime, the PDC staff, um, both my department and economics, is working on affordability analysis to support HRSD. The affordability analysis is really data that you get to give to EPA to show them that the hardship that increased sewer rates will have on your citizens. And typically, the EPA looks at the, how it affects people at the median household income, but we want to look at people at lower income levels and just a variety of factors to make a compelling case um, on why we need to keep rates as reasonable as possible. Uh, the two issues that HRSD can negotiate with, with the EPA and DEQ, are level of service. That's basically how big a storm will the sewer system have to handle once it's fixed. So as you can imagine, we can not afford to build a sewer system that doesn't overflow if there's a hurricane or a nor'easter, but you kind of have to decide what level is big enough. The second thing they can negotiate on is how many years do they get to do all these repairs and fixes? And that could range from maybe 15 to 25. So those two issues will drive how much rates increase. And so we want to give them the best information they can to make um, you know, effective negotiations. So those are all my comments. You're probably not going to hear a lot more about this for the next year or so, but I'll be happy to answer questions. And there's no action. Any questions, comments? Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Did, I have a yep. Did uh, HRSD ask for the affordability analysis? Yes. They asked for support. Yeah. We're working through the utility director's committee. Thank you. 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 Okay, next up we have uh, retail sales analysis from the economic quarterly by uh, James Clare. Good morning, sir. Good morning. I'm here to brief you today on the Hampton Roads Economics Quarterly and retail sales in particular. 
the Hampton Roads Economics Quarterly, which you have in front of you, is a document that the economic staff has produced since uh, the fall of 2008. And while the style has changed, the overall format has not. It has a main article that deals with a current issue that's confronting our economies here in Hampton Roads, and then an economic outlook that projects what's going to happen over the next few months and indicator graphics that show the current state of the economy. Retail sales fundamentally support the economy, and even further, you could say retail sales are the economy. While there has always been an emphasis on productive activities like manufacturing and agriculture, trade gets, hand, gets items into the hands of those who value it most, and in a very real way creates wealth. As you can, say, as you can see, personal consumption expenditures are 68% of the U.S. economy and a little bit of a smaller share for the regional economy because of the size of defense spending here. U.S. retail sales had a significant dip with the recession, but have had an even stronger recovery since then. And so overall, U.S. retail sales are up 13.3% since the start of the recession. While Hampton Roads saw a similar size dip in retail sales during the recession, our recovery hasn't been quite as strong and so retail sales remain below their pre-recession peak. <clears throat> As you can see, U.S. and Hampton Roads retail sales grew in tandem throughout the 90s, but then in March 2007, Hampton Roads retail sales peaked far sooner than they did in the rest of the country and then began to decline. And while the decline was similar in size, again, you can see the difference in the recovery since the end of the recession. Another way to measure the impact of retail trade on the economy and to measure our performance against other metropolitan areas is to look at the six-year change in retail employment. Uh, here we have a list of all of our reference MSAs. Those are metropolitan areas with populations between one to three million. And as you can see, Hampton Roads has had the worst uh, performance in terms of retail employment of any of those metropolitan areas, declining almost 12% since the beginning of the recession. Items that you buy through internet retailers such as Amazon and other sites obviously take away from regional retail sales and from sales at your own local stores. Retail sales broke the 6% mark in the fourth quarter of 2013. And while they do not explain all of the decline in Hampton Roads retail sales, they do explain some of the decline. <clears throat> you can break up retail sales in the region into their individual constituent categories. And while the three major categories are there, are general merchandise, uh, food and beverage stores, that is grocery stores, and then restaurant categories, there are a variety of business classifications that have retail sales. And these variety of business classifications have very different experiences during the course of the recession. As you can see, businesses that sell necessities, uh, basic food items, and do repair work have seen growth during uh, since the beginning of the recession in 2007 in Hampton Roads, while other business categories that sell discretionary items have shrunk since the beginning of the recession. Uh, one anomaly that I'd like to point out here is the food service and drinking places, i.e. restaurants, which have seen significant growth both here in the region and nationally to the same extent. You can further see that there are structural impacts on some of the industries, particularly those retail sales that are tied to the housing market. As construction employment and construction of housing has declined, you've seen a decline in the sale of building materials. Additionally, <coughs> furniture sales, which are accelerated by turnover in the housing market, have declined since the beginning of the recession. Overall, Hampton Roads had had a long period of retail sales growth that was set aside by this recession. Now, some of our issues were generated by the fact that our recession started earlier here, really in force in 2007, while the rest of the country <coughs> didn't begin experiencing a true recession until 2008. But we've also seen a series of economic events that have derailed our recovery, and these include uh, the closing of the Ford plant that started the recession locally, uh, the Franklin paper mill closing, the disestablishment of Joint Forces Command, and then current budget issues with the Department of Defense, sequestration, and the government shutdown. 
that concludes my formal remarks, and I'm prepared for any questions that you might have. Okay. Questions? Comments? Okay. Thank you, sir. All right, next on the agenda, item five, establishment of a committee to address the reoccurrent flooding. Uh, yeah, Dwight, you want to? Yeah, uh, it's a sort of a two-part thing here. Um, we received a letter from the city of Virginia Beach. Uh, I think uh, either Jim or uh, Jim, will, Jim will be prepared to make some remarks, but I thought it would be appropriate for you all to hear a, a, a brief summary from uh, Ben McFarland. Uh, on exactly what is going on in the region around the state on the current flooding. So if you will, Mr. Chairman, we'll have him do some preparatory remarks and then we'll hear from the city of Virginia Beach. Good morning, Ben. Good morning. Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, recurrent flooding is an issue that many communities in Hampton Roads are attempting to address. This morning I'd like to give you an overview of some of the efforts that are going on that may impact local governments in Hampton Roads. It is common knowledge that our region is vulnerable to flooding. Whether it is from heavy rainfall, increasingly high tides, or storm surges, the end result is the same. Damage to public and private property, interrupted economic activity, and negative impacts to our health and quality of life. But the recurrent flooding we experience now is not our only problem. Sea level rise, as a result of both climate change and land subsidence, is already contributing to flooding in our region, and is projected to result in more and more flooding in the future. Recent findings by various experts from Hampton Roads and elsewhere suggest that we could see five feet of sea level rise locally by the end of the 21st century. In response to the ongoing threat of recurrent flooding and future risk posed by sea level rise, the HRPDC and others have been working to develop high quality information that can assist local governments in adopting appropriate responses. The results of these efforts include reports by HRPDC, a study by the Hampton Roads Transportation Planning Organization, and last year's recurrent flooding study produced by VIMS at the request of the General Assembly. In addition to these reports, there are several ongoing efforts at the federal, state, and regional level. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers is in the middle of completing the North Atlantic Coast Comprehensive Study, part of the federal government's response to Hurricane Sandy. At the state level, last summer, the Secure Commonwealth Panel established a recurrent flooding subpanel that is now looking at developing recommendations for the state related to outreach and education, data and mapping, and policies and procedures. In addition, the General Assembly earlier this month passed a resolution to establish a joint subcommittee to develop recommendations for addressing recurrent flooding. At the regional level, we are acquiring new LIDAR elevation data and continuing with grants from the Virginia Coastal Zone Management Program as well as the Hampton Roads Adaptation Forum, a partnership with ODU and Virginia Sea Grant. Our regional academic institutions have also been working on this issue. However, while all of these issues, these efforts are contributing to our knowledge of the impacts of, of and possible responses to recurrent flooding and sea level rise, these efforts to date have not helped us make the transition from discussing options to implementing solutions. Additional knowledge is helpful for planning efforts, but at the end of the day, adapting to recurrent flooding and sea level rise will require local governments to change policies. This next step would benefit from a coordinated regional effort. The impacts of recurrent flooding and sea level rise are felt regionally as well as locally. In addition, cooperation on standards and policies will reduce costs, prevent unnecessary redundancy, and give us a stronger voice in working with the state and federal governments. Most importantly, there is no effort that is dedicated to developing adaptation policies specifically for Hampton Roads, to discussing the benefits and costs of these policies, or to recommending specific actions for local governments. As a result, there is an opportunity for the Planning District Commission to help local governments identify, choose, and implement concrete steps to adapt to recurrent flooding and sea level rise. Therefore, in response to a request from the City of Virginia Beach, the HRPDC staff recommends that the Commission establish a special committee to address planning for recurrent flooding and sea level rise. The mission for this committee shall be to develop recommendations for local governments, advocate for state and federal support, and serve as the primary regional contact for coordinating efforts with federal and state agencies and academic institutions. The membership of this committee shall be composed of staff from interested localities representing multiple departments and other regional stakeholders as deemed fit. That concludes my prepared remarks. I'd be happy to answer any questions if you have any. Questions? Yes, sir, Mr. Spool. 
comment, Mr. Chair. I think uh, the, the mayor uh, sent a letter, which I believe is in everyone's packet, uh, talking about the, uh, the case really that Ben has made in his presentation, so I don't need to repeat it. But essentially, this is, uh, this is obviously a regional issue that crosses all of our uh, boundaries. And uh, as we've done so well in the past in terms of joint planning efforts, whether it be solid waste or sewer systems or whatever, I think this is uh, really ripe for a coordinating mechanism at the PDC. There's lots of moving parts, lots of agencies, lots of studies going on, lots of committees taking a look at this at the state and local level. Um, and I think it really cries out for some regional uh, coordination and action. So we would certainly suggest that, uh, that the PDC establish this uh, committee to uh, be the coordinator for all of us. Okay. Any comments? Okay, uh, next on the list is um, organizational structure and succession planning. First of all, I want to uh, thank everyone last month for your comments and inputs. We had quite a lively discussion about this agency, the TPO, and the new uh, Accountability Commission and how we think this organization should be structured moving forward. So I do want to appreciate the input and the joint efforts between the PDC and the TPO. Um, the uh, budget uh, and uh, committee met this morning and we have a suggestion. I think we want to defer first to our attorney and, uh, and then we'll open it up for some discussions. Tom? Thank you, Chairman. My name is Tom Ingleam. I'm uh, with Wilcox and Savage and we're counsel to the PDC. At the joint uh, meeting of the uh, Personnel and Budget Committee, I advise the committee that the uh, bylaws of the TPO provide that the executive director of the PDC is the person who will also serve as the uh, executive director of the TPO. Uh, at the meeting, I further observe for the benefit of the committee that under the new uh, legislation that has been proposed, 1253, uh, it provides that the uh, staff of the Hampton Roads TPO shall serve as the staff uh, and provide the commission with office space and administrative support uh, until the commission has fully established a, a staff of its own, if at all. And at the, at the board meeting, uh, there was further discussion, and I believe that I'll turn it back to the uh, chairperson now. Okay. Any, anyone on the board want to add any comments before we actually get into the discussion? Because I thought it was uh, pretty lively and, and, and informative of how we want to move forward with this. But uh, considering the time frame that we're dealing with, there's some action items that we definitely need to take as far as putting um, a search committee together as well as uh, an RFQ out for um, this position. Uh, Clyde, you want to? Well, let, let me make a motion and maybe that will put something on the table then for discussion. Is, is that acceptable or do you want to have discussion first? What's the pleasure? I'd rather have discussion first. Okay. okay. <clears throat> Mr. Wallace, you want? My discussion is to hear what, what has been discussed. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, that's why we asked the attorney to go first because yeah. clearly looking at the bylaws and reading the bylaws and what that position entails and how that person that's going to replace our current executive director is going to be the executive director of both the PDC and the TPO, then um, stand in line with our bylaws. I think it's in line that we go out and look and do a search for a new executive director that's going to hold both of those positions. And if, if I may, I think the uh, current motion will late what the discussion was, a summary of the discussion. So I, I guess the clarification that I'm seeking, this is this has no reference to staffing for HIV. Staffing for the accountability, the accountability commission. commission? Yes. Yes or no? Well, if you read the bylaws and you also look at, I think we have in front of you a copy of the 2014 session of a House bill 1253. Does everybody have that in your package? Yes. If you go back to 
lines 181 through 191, which is the, the third and the last page of the, it clearly talks about staffing of the accountability commission and what role that would play and who will serve and how it's going to operate. So it, it pretty much links the accountability commission with the TPO and our bylaws link the PDC with the TPO. So, Mr. Turner. Uh, yes, Mr. Chairperson. Um, the question you asked was whether or not the motion deals with the HRTAC, and it does not. The motion deals with the executive director of the PDC and TPO, as the bylaws would provide. The observation was that the current legislation regarding the HRTAC by default will have the TPO uh, staff and executive director providing services to that commission until it is fully established as the legislation reads. Okay, then to clarify, in 25 words or less, we're seeking a successor for Dwight uh, to continue in the context that he currently exists in terms of his, his oversight and operation. And by matter of legislation, HTAC will require his successor to work in that particular realm until that body is standing and has uh, developed a staff of his own. That's correct. Absolutely. You summed it up well, sir. Any other questions or comments? <coughs> Mr. Chairman, I've mentioned yeah. the yeah. uh, staff is reminding me uh, we won't be taking action in the workshop that formal action and formal motion would have to occur during the uh, action part of the agenda. Correct. But you can have Certainly have a peek at what the recommendation is from PNB in formal sense if you want that too, but the formal action has to take place after we go into that particular part of the agenda. Uh, if, George, if it would help, I could read the motion that, uh, that's going to be made. I'm not making it now, but I will make it during the meeting so that will give you a sense of what, okay. what uh, the recommendation This is an information motion as, as opposed to a motion for action. Yeah, th this is just for information purposes. The action will be taken during the meeting. Thank you, accept. But uh, yeah, the, what during our, our action part of the meeting, the motion I, I plan to make will read something like this: to, that that I move that we that the uh, PDC initiate the selection of an executive director CEO to replace Mr. Farmer upon his report retirement on July 1, 2014, and to allocate up to $65,000 from unallocated funds to compensate a search form firm that will be engaged through an RFP process, and to have the executive director of the, PD, of the uh, uh, PDC to serve as the interim director of the PDC until Mr. Farmer's replacement <coughs> has been hired. So in, in essence, to, to uh, initiate a search process to uh, hire a search firm, pay up to $65,000, and to have the, uh, the current uh, uh, deputy director serve as interim director until that new person is, is named. So that, that's what we're going to recommend at the time of, of uh, the action part of the meeting. Any comments or further discussion on that? Chairman, uh, yes, just a uh, make sure I didn't miss anything on what we've said there. This is pretty much what, Dwight, what you recommended at the retreat? Well, I'll play some options there that you could go with separate, permanent with separate executive directors, or you could do uh, uh, an executive director that oversees all of the functions. And when I presented it then, we could see this accountability commission coming to us. At that time, we didn't see the legislation. I thought at some point that, that board, your board, the, the Accountability Commission will also need a CEO, executive director. So you need to be thinking about whether you have one that's an oversight of all. And until that commission has stood up, as Tom has said here, it would be a little bit premature to make that decision until that board has stood up. And you all, the, the chief elected officials who will serve on there, will make that final decision as to whether you want this one under all. But for now, as Tom said, under the current PDC and TPO bylaws, uh, you can move forward now rather than wait and lose this time to go ahead and do the search and so forth. So 
I, I think this is the rational way to do this and stay within the, the guidelines of the bylaws. Stay Thank you. Okay. Any other comments? Okay. That was painless. <coughs> Okay, the regular agenda. Uh, item 7, submitted public comments. Uh, there aren't any submitted public comments. Um, any new public comments will definitely be distributed as a handout at the meeting. Uh, public comment period. We've got two speakers here, Mr. Ellis James. And he'll be followed by Mr. Mark Godoji Yatrosky. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Ellis W. James. I reside in the city of Norfolk and have done so for a few years. I would like to address something that I had thought would go away and stay away. And this is not intended to be any disrespect to my friends in Virginia Beach. But <laughs> we have a disagreement. The maglev project, with all of its promises, that was initiated originally at ODU, turned out to be quite a failure in a lot of respects. Not the least of which was the company that was pushing the project made some pretty significant promises about what would be done or not done depending upon the success of the project itself. Um, I am really personally appalled that we're bringing this back, especially when we're talking about building the tracks above roadways. Now, I'm not naive. I know we don't live in California and we don't have collapsing <coughs> overlying lanes because we don't have earthquakes of that significance. However, can you imagine in Virginia Beach the disruption to the base economy and the people trying to do business if we had that kind of activity going on? The other thing that concerns me greatly is that <clears throat> We have a core track in Norfolk. We have the ability to see the beginnings of the development surrounding the light rail project. And now all of a sudden we're going to put in an additional newer type situation which would require riders in Norfolk to make a change instead of being able to ride to whatever the destination ultimately turns out to be in Virginia Beach. I certainly hope my friends in Virginia Beach will rethink this. The promises of saving a lot of money is very enticing. It's seductive. But in the long run, I think this idea is going to cost a whole lot more money than we need to spend in order to bring light rail and its advantages to Hampton Roads. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sir. Next up, Mr. Mark Godoji Yatrosky. Good morning, Mr. Chair, honorable commissioners. Um, this is not a hangover from St. Patrick's Day, these green beads, nor is it me channeling my inner hippie. I was at a rally in Richmond on Saturday for the expansion of Medicare coverage, Medicaid coverage. And the organizers handed these out to the participants and told us that each bead on each strand represents 200 of our fellow Virginians who are without health insurance. Now, I believe that health care is a vital component 
in the economy of our region, that sick workers are less productive, that those who are too sick to work are a drain on the economy. And we have been provided a, an opportunity, we have a window of opportunity for expanding Medicaid coverage within the Commonwealth. Potentially some 400,000 of our fellow citizens could benefit from this if we proceed with it. Everybody at this table, at these tables, is a person of influence in this community. And I would urge you to contact your members of the House and Senate and emphasize to them what an important element in the economy this constitutes and that it's the right thing to do. While the federal government is paying the bill for this expansion, we have an opportunity to look at how the program is functioning and fine tune it. I'm sure there will be bumps in the road as there is with any major new initiative, but that does not mean we should not pursue it. We have numerous hospitals in this area that will also benefit from this program. They are significant contributors to the overall economy. So I urge you all to take these few days that remain before the General Assembly reconvenes on Monday and talk to your legislators. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Okay, next on the agenda, item nine, approval of the consent items. Is there a motion to approve items A through J? So moved. Second. Is there a second? Okay. Second. Any discussion? Unreadiness? Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed, same way. Right. Okay. Item 10, the organizational structure and succession planning. As we discussed, um, Earlier, it is the recommendation of the Personnel and Budget Committee, the Joint Personnel and Budget Committee, that we um, go out and start a search for the successor of uh, Mr. Farmer and stand in compliance with our current bylaws. Um, I'll yield to uh, Mayor Holman from Williamsburg to present the motion and any discussion afterwards, if we could clap. Okay, thank you, Ken. Um, I'd like to move that the PDC initiate the selection of executive director, CEO, to replace Mr. Farmer upon his retirement on July 1st, 2014, and to allocate up to $65,000 from unallocated <coughs> funds to compensate a search firm that will be engaged through an RFP process and to have the executive, excuse me, the deputy director of the PDC to serve as interim director of the PDC until Mr. Farmer's replacement has been hired. Second. Okay. It's been moved and properly second. Uh, any unreadiness? Okay. Please Mr. Baker? One, one question for Absolutely. clarification. The, yeah. the $65,000 that you talked about for the consultant, I'm actually assuming that that would other ancillary expenses, travel expenses for candidates, uh, and that, I, I just wanted to make sure that we didn't get down the road and somebody said, well, that actually be done. Sure. It, it should, uh, we also have in our budget a fund item for recruitment, so if necessary, we, we have a low wiggle room we can tap into that to, to get people here and so forth. Any other discussion or comments? Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed, same right? <coughs> all right, thank you. Also, in, in line with that, the Personnel and Budget Committee, if it's okay with this body, that I'd like for the Personnel and Budget Committee to assume and perform the duties of the selection committee of this candidate that we bring back to the full board. Is there any objection? And do we need a motion for that as well? <coughs> okay. Can we get a motion from the floor that the Personnel and Budget Committee serve as the selection committee? So okay. Second. In there a second. Okay, any unreadiness there? You need, moved by Mayor Linda Johnson of Suffolk and second. Oh, I'm <laughs> Selena? 
of Suffolk and second by Dr. Ella Ward Chesapeake. Did you get that? All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Same right? Okay. Next item, the uh, establishing of the committee to address the reoccurring flooding. Mr. Mayor. Yes, sir. Mr. Like Jones. Put it on the floor. Yes, sir. Uh, I move that we, establish, we approve the establishment of a committee to address recurrent flooding. Okay. So, second. Say. second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Same right? All right, thank you. Question of clarification, that includes rising sea level also, does it not? Yeah. You're in there, George. Uh -huh. You're in there. <laughs> We're all in. It's all part of it. Okay, there was just one mention to add on this specifically in the motion. I just want to be sure. That was the intent. That's all. Okay, very good. Any other comments? Okay, item 12, the uh, three month tentative schedule. Um, we want to make a well, let me yield to you, Dwight, about the retreat, the, the retreat and because of the discussion and the dialogue that we had at the last meeting and what we'd like to do going forward and as far as switching time. Ladies and gentlemen, generally what we've been doing for a number of years now is in February we have the uh, PDC retreat, no MPO, TPO meeting. In May we have a TPO retreat, no PDC meeting. But we had a joint retreat in February for what for all intents and purposes it turned into a HR TPO board retreat because of the Ability <coughs> Commission legislation and so forth. So staff is recommending that the PDC have uh, a retreat in the month of May. And the way I would recommend we do that to minimize inconvenience to you all, if you agree, is to uh, flip the meeting times of the PDC and TPO so that the TPO could go ahead and have an action uh, month in the month of May, and I think it's going to need to do that. Start that meeting at 9.30, uh, and I would say let's safely allocate up to an hour and a half to 11 o'clock for, uh, for that meeting to occur, and then at 11, promptly, the uh, or sooner if that meeting is over, have the PDC start its lunch retreat, and, and that we will give you lunch and have you out of here no later than 1 o'clock. So we, I don't think the bylaws require we have any formal posing of that, but we do need to make mention of it both verbally and in our <coughs> schedule of upcoming meetings if we change that time. So essentially a flip flop the start time, and then we'll get you out of there all about the o'clock. Again, that's the May meeting, not next month, but the May meeting. Okay, is that it? All right, thank you. Okay, you also have in your package item 13, the status reports of uh, uh, the advisory committees, <coughs> uh, which you can have for your uh, pleasure of reading later. Uh, correspondence of interest, item 14. We have, what do we have, two pieces of correspondence here, and that's all attached as well. Okay, item 15 for your information. What do we have for our information? Yeah, we've got quite a few pieces here. If, uh, you can see legislative session highlights, um, which I believe we're going back in this special session. Is it Monday? Monday. Okay. Good luck there. Okay, um, new business. Dwight? We mentioned the piece on the advanced manufacturing. Yes, I received a call after the event of the party from the resident of PDC, uh, and a call also from uh, Dr. Barry Johnson with BCU. And uh, Barry uh, and Bob Crum, my counterpart in Richmond, have been working together on a consortium for CCAM, that's the Commonwealth Center for Advanced Manufacturing. And they had, uh, they had, with the Crater PDC and the Richmond PDC, had decided to come together in the last month uh, and put in uh, a letter of intent or application to the uh, uh, Economic Development Administration for the U.S. Uh, government uh, uh, for what's known as IMCP. That's uh, <coughs> 
that is investing in manufacturing communities partnership. Now, what they've, they've asked me if I would uh, agree to is to bring before you a brief explanation of this investing in manufacturing communities partnership. It's essentially going to be an EBA initiative, and let me take you through. Everybody should have a copy of this at their place. And there's a few short slides here, and I'm not going to read all the material, but let me take you through what this IMCP is. Uh, it's, uh, if you look at under the what is it, uh, under the Department of Commerce, it's a goal to accelerate concerns of manufacturing in regions around the nation. And uh, who, what is the benefit? Well, if we were, as a region, co-joining as a consortium with Richmond, and with Petersburg and the tobacco communities, a lot of folks that I've talked to in the last few days believe we could have an incredibly strong proposal for this mega region, if you will, regarding advanced manufacturing. And right now, the federal government does not have dollars on the table to award, but they believe they'll have up to about $1.3 billion, dollars, as shown here on the slide, to make available to 12 regions that they will select from this application process, and those 12 communities around the nation would get preferential treatment when vying for these $1.3 billion of funds to, to step up the nation's efforts on advanced manufacturing. So if you flip the page to slide three, you'll see key areas. The two that I think come out big in my view is workforce and training, which I know I've reminded them when I talked to Bob and uh, Barry, you know, we have uh, Peninsula Southside Workforce Development entities here, and there's also uh, money for advanced research and so forth. Uh, keep in mind, the CCAMS work has Rolls Royce up in uh, Prince George, uh, the Crater Petersburg area, uh, Huntington Ingalls Newport News, uh, Cannon is involved in that. Uh, so, and some universities are involved in that. So, I think this is uh, taking off. If you go to slide four, you'll see the participating agencies uh, in this particular program. And again, on slide five, uh, if you authorize me to uh, sign a draft letter, and there's a draft letter should be at your seat, um, it's saying to those uh, that we will send this <coughs> joint application to that the Hampton Roads Planning District Commission has at this stage, uh, supporting the concept of having this region in with Richmond and Petersburg and the tobacco communities when we make, when they, we make this joint application to see if we might be one of those 12 communities around the nation. So, as I told Bob and Barry, this, this region of Hampton Roads is incredibly rich with potential for advanced manufacturing and advanced logistics in the CCAL program also. So I think, uh, it's worth your all's uh, uh, efforts and our efforts to go ahead and submit this letter that's in front of you uh, to say we are very interested in like to be a part of the consortium. And I think this region comprising of all of those entities would be a hard group to be. So, I think and we're, we're and it would be us cutting our teeth at the first attempt of this uh, mega, region. mega region that we've been uh, discussing for quite some while. Any comments on that? Yes. Yes, ma'am. Um, I was in Prince George when the Rolls Royce project happened and the Commonwealth Center for Advanced Manufacturing was conceptualized. And um, I don't see how uh, Hampton Roads joining the effort could be anything but a wonderful plan. So I would move the motion on page six of the PowerPoint that the board authorized staff to send us a letter that's been described. Very good. Is that a second? Second. Okay. Second by Mr. Baker. Just all in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Okay. We Thank will you. keep you abreast of how that is or whatever. Very good. Great idea. Okay. Any other old business that come before the body? Okay. Hearing none, we're adjourned. Thank you.